Vamps Connection Program um, uh, st started this year, and uh, the goal of Vamps Vamp Connection Program is to understand the importance uh, that diversity and inclusion uh, have in our lives, and um, our commitment to inclusion uh, within our beautiful uh, culture. Uh, Vamp Connections uh, organizes uh, events throughout the year to cover uh, as well as showcase uh, uh, a number of uh, Asian Canadian cultural uh, aspects and classics. Um, the events that we organize and, 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 and the conversation that we uh, uh, organize as well uh, aim to increase awareness to participate um, uh, and, and practice uh, inclusion uh, and avoid uh, exclusion. Uh, highlight the initiatives, uh, initiatives that promote cultural diversity and increase participation of uh, Pan-Asian communities, um, including youth um, and, and people with disabilities and, and, uh, uh, and the community uh, in, in, in the wider context. Uh, VAM Connections was launched uh, at the 20th, uh, 2020 annual uh, general meeting, as I mentioned before, with the inaugural panel um, that focused on celebrating uh, cultural diversity in our society. Uh, this panel uh, included uh, Paul Crow, Patricia Wurich, and uh, Raminder Rosange. So um, this is the second event of that series. Uh, and I would like to introduce uh, our presenter this evening, uh, Dr. Neil Christie, uh, who is uh, the chair of the Department of History, uh, Latin and Political Science at Langara College, Vancouver, and is an adjunct professor, professor in uh, medieval studies at the University of Victoria. He received his PhD in Islamic history uh, from the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. Uh, since 2012, he has been an instructor in history at Langara College, um, teaching courses on the history of uh, Europe and the Muslim world. Dr. Christie is the author of uh, numerous articles and two books uh, in particular. Um, the book, the first book is the book of, of the Jihad of Ali ibn Tahir al Sulaimani, and which is a text translation and commentary, uh, which was published in 2015. And the second book is Muslims and Crusaders, Christianity's Wars in the Middle East, uh, uh, 1095 to 1382 from the Islamic sources. And that was published by Ralph Ledge in 2020. So today's uh, public lecture or presentation is on exploring Islam's contribution to Asia with Ibn Battuta. And this presentation explores uh, some of the contributions that Muslim communities made to the culture of medieval Asia. Uh, and this presentation is uh, guided by the travel record of Muhammad Ibn Battuta, a Moroccan traveler who between 1325 to 1349 visited Muslim communities located um, in China, India, and Southeast Asia, as well as Central Asia. Uh, Muslim overall in, in, in the world, uh, according to various estimates, uh, make up about two, 2 billion at the moment, and about 3% of the Canadian population uh, identifies, uh, identifies uh, themselves as uh, Muslim. So uh, I, again, uh, I, I thank uh, Dr. Neil Christie uh, for uh, being able to um, uh, offer this uh, presentation. And uh, now I invite Dr. Neil Christie to start the presentation. Thank you very much, Shahid. Uh, I'll just ask you to make me host so that I can share my screen if I may, please. Good, excellent, thank you very much. Okay, let's see if I can make this work. Okay. So there we go. Can I just get a thumbs up from Shahid that uh, the screen is showing and there are no weird menus or anything else showing at any on screen. Excellent, good. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, and to talk. Uh, thank you, Shahid. I'd also like to thank Jasper uh, Sloan Yip for helping to set things up. I'd also like to thank everyone who's come to uh, listen to this talk. Um, obviously, these things work a lot better if there are actually people there to listen to it. I get sick of the sound of my own voice. So, um, today we're talking about Ibn Battuta. 
I love it when it does that. Okay, <laughs> try again. In 1325, a Moroccan traveler named Muhammad ibn Battuta left his hometown of Tangier. And the plan was he was going to go and perform the Hajj to Mecca and then return home. The journey should have taken him something in the region of about two years. He came home 24 years later in 1349, and soon he was off traveling again. Then he came home again in 1355, and by that time he had visited the equivalent of about 40 modern countries and covered a distance of approximately 73,000 miles. Now, Ibn Battuta was born into a family of legal scholars in 1304, and he himself received, in many ways, the traditional uh, education that uh, you would expect under that circumstance. He was trained in Islamic law, uh, particularly in the Maliki school of Islamic law, which was the most common one in Morocco at the time. He was a Sunni Muslim following the majority form of Islam, and I mean, all Muslims will perform the Hajj at some point if they can, and certainly it made sense for him at one point to decide he was going to perform the Hajj. But he quickly discovered, after he set off, that he was afflicted with a powerful vandalist, and he wanted to see more of the world. And so he started traveling basically wherever he could go, which was actually a pretty wide uh, swath of territory. By the time that he was done, he had traveled as far east as China, as far south as Southeast Asia and South Asia, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, and even down as far as Mali in Africa, and down the east coast of Africa as well. As far west as, um, well, obviously he went home to the west, um, but as far north as um, Central Asia, uh, including a number of countries, uh, which in the modern day are countries that end with the name Stan, as in land of Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan, these kinds of places. In the process, he did manage to get the Hajj done. In fact, he did the Hajj three times. He was going back and forth, so he figured he'd do it along the way. Soon after Ibn Battuta arrived home, the Sultan of Morocco commissioned an Andalusian scholar by the name of Ibn Juzai to get together with Ibn Battuta and put together a record of Ibn Battuta's travels. The two men collaborated on this work for about two years, and the result of that was a book by the title of Tahfat al-Nazar fi Kharab al-Amsar wa Ajaib al-Asfar, The Gift to Those Who Contemplate on the wonders of cities and the marvels of traveling. Needless to say, that's a bit of a mouthful. So most people refer to that work simply as Arechla, which means the journey, or Rechlet ibn Battuta, the journey of ibn Battuta. This wasn't the first travelogue of this type that anyone had ever written, but it became one of the best known ones in the centuries that followed. In fact, there's even, I hope I, I, there's even a, um, um, there's even a pretty good penguin, uh, is it penguin? No, it's a picador uh, edition of parts of his travels uh, available in English translation, which I can show you at the end of the talk. I was going to show you it now, but of course I realize everyone's looking at my slides, so it shows so they can't see it. His work done, Ibn Battuta then retired. Well, he took up a judicial post in the provinces of Morocco, uh, where he continued to work until he died sometime between 1368 and 1377. And it was left to Ibn Juzai to publish Ibn Battuta's travelogue. Some scholars have suggested that before he did so, Ibn Juzai took the opportunity to make it more exciting, shall we say. Uh, spicing it up with a few details that Ibn Battuta had not included, but which he thought might attract more of a readership. It's been suggested in particular that part of the record that we have of Ibn Battuta's travels in China um, may actually be fabricated. Whatever the truth of that, that's not why we're here today. Today, what I'd like to do is take Ibn Battuta's record and use it to give us insight into the contributions that were made by Muslims 
to the cultures of medieval Asia, some of which have um, reverberations that continue into the modern day. And in doing so, I want to follow the lead of Vams and adopt a broad perspective on what we mean by Asia. So covering everything as far west as Cyprus and Turkey, as far north as Central Asia, as far east as Japan and Southeast Asia, and as far south as Arabia and South Asia. Uh, this map uh, from Wikipedia actually includes part of the Russian Federation as part of Asia, but I'm gonna follow the Vams lead in this regard. As you can see from the map, Ibn Tuta got to a lot of countries in that region, and he certainly left us his impressions. And so I want to use those as a jumping off point for an exploration of Muslim contributions to Asia. Now, obviously that's a big topic, so I just want to note a few particular highlights that uh, we see in his work. In the process, I am of course going to give the typical historian's warning, which is that I'm going to be making a lot of generalized comments about things. You can assume that there's probably an exception to almost everything that I'm going to say today. As they say, historians rush in where angels fear to tread, so here we go. When we look at a map of the Muslim world around the time that Ibn Battuta was living, one thing that's very striking is how politically divided that world was. There were a range of dynasties and a range of empires installed throughout the region, and you can tell from all the various different labels on the map that you have a whole range of different states there. And they were so the Muslim world was immensely politically fragmented, and a good number of those states were also at war with each other. But the fact that Ibn Battuta was able to travel mostly safely from one end of the Muslim world to the other and beyond testifies to the unifying forces that bound that world together and permeated the societies in which Ibn Battuta and other Muslims lived, despite the political fragmentation. As it happens, this also testifies to the value that was placed on Ibn Battuta by the various people whom he encountered. I'll come back to that. Now, this doesn't mean that travel was always safe. Just as in the modern day, there were hazards. During one of Ibn Battuta's journeys, he was separated from his companions, captured by brigands, robbed, imprisoned in a cave, and nearly murdered. He managed to escape that, and he rejoined his comrades, but then things got worse. The group took to sea on basically two. One of those ships was then destroyed in a storm while it was moored off Kojakod on the west coast of India. The other one, in the meantime, sailed away, taking with it Ibn Battuta's luggage, which he never saw again. I have had Ibn Battuta's experience of arriving somewhere and never seeing my luggage, so uh, I can understand his frustrations. In my case, it was in Brussels, but that's an aside. But despite Ibn Battuta's frustrations and misfortunes, he was still able to continue with his journey and forge on. So we're going to start our exploration at Damascus. Here you can see the Umayyad Great Mosque at Damascus, uh, built in the 8th century and uh, restored a bit since. Ibn Battuta tells us that he was in Damascus in 1348, during the height of the spread of the Black Death in the Muslim world and in Europe. In his account, he tells us of a religious procession that he witnessed. The aim of the procession was for people to entreat God for salvation from the plague. And his description runs as follows. The military leaders, the descendants of the prophet, the judges, the doctors of the law, and all other classes of people in their several degrees assembled in the great mosque until it was filled to overflowing with them and spent the Thursday night there in prayers and liturgies and supplications. Then after performing the dawn prayer on Friday morning, they all went out together, walking barefoot and carrying Qur'ans in their hands. The entire population of the city joined the Exodus, male and female, small and large. The Jews went out with their book of the law 
and the Christians with their gospel, their women and children with them, the whole concourse of them in tears and humble supplications, imploring the favour of God through his book and his prophets. So the first Muslim contribution we can highlight to Asia was, well, Islam. This faith spread throughout Asia through a variety of means. Much of West Asia was brought into the fold of Islam during the 7th and 8th centuries, uh, when the Muslims first expanded out of the Arabian Peninsula on a number of military expeditions. After that, much of the spread was the result of the activities of Muslim merchants and missionaries, though we must acknowledge that some Muslim rulers did also try to further the spread of the faith by force. Uh, North India, for example, was attacked by a number of Muslim rulers in the 11th centuries. But the faith then became a force that helped to bind Muslim, the Muslim world together, even as it politically fragmented. It also extended its reach outside of the territories that were ruled by Muslims, such that Ibn Battuta was able to find Muslim communities to stay in, regardless of where he went, even when he went to lands where the rulers weren't Muslim. Another thing that's very striking about Ibn Battuta's account is the fact that you have Christians and Jews participating in this ritual. Now, the Muslim holy book, the Qur'an, has religious tolerance built into it right from the start. Qur'an 2256 states explicitly, let there be no compulsion in religion. And the holy text reminds us repeatedly that Christians and Jews and others, provided that they are obedient to God and do good, will make it to paradise. They will have nothing to fear on the day of judgment, is the way it's often put. And the general rule that Muslim rulers adopted in dealing with non-Muslims living in their societies was that non-Muslims were allowed to maintain their faith and were entitled to protection from rulers against external threats provided that they paid a poll tax, and in some cases they were required to abide by certain, certain social restrictions. Now, this wasn't an ideal situation, of course, and there were pl plenty of instances when you have Muslim rulers who persecuted non-Muslims living under their rule. That's something that still happens today. But the general situation was such that a, a non-Muslim living in the Muslim world in the Middle Ages was in a much more comfortable situation than a non-Christian living in Christian ruled lands. At the time that Ibn Battuta was recalling, in a number of Christian countries, primarily Germany, they were persecuting, torturing and executing Jews, blaming them for spreading the plague among Christians by poisoning wells and other nefarious means. In general, if you were a non-Christian in, in Christian society in the Middle Ages, you were marginalized, you were persecuted. Lepers, likewise, got marginalized during the Black Death and persecuted to the point that actually it may be partially responsible for the disappearance of leprosy in Western Europe. Islam was also a very flexible faith in that as it spread, it was influenced by local customs and philosophies that affected the way that it was practiced. And that's something that we still see today, because if you go to Saudi Arabia, you will see that Islam is practiced there in a very different way from the way it's practiced in Iran, which is very different from the way it's practiced in India, which is very different from the way it's practiced in Indonesia, and so on and so on. So we have a faith then that is tolerant and adaptable and made it very effective as a force for unity between Muslims and also between Muslims and non-Muslims, even as they saw the world falling apart around them politically. That's something that I think some people forget in modern day. One of the other things that Islam brought with it was a unified legal system. Now, obviously there were some variations according to local schools and um, customs, but in general, somebody who lived in the Muslim world could expect wherever they went that any legal case that they got involved in would be judged roughly according to the same kinds of procedures and the same kinds of rulings. 
This also meant that Muslim scholars were able to contribute to the legal tradition from all over the Muslim world. And one of the most influential figures in the development of Islamic law was a chap called Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, who was from Bukhara in modern day Uzbekistan. He compiled a tome of legal wisdom called al jama al-Sahih, the collection of true reports about the Prophet. Ibn Battuta visited the tomb of al-Bukhari. This is a restored tomb. It's a, uh, his tomb has been restored a number of times. This is a later uh, version of it, as it were, or the modern version, I suppose. But anyway, um, Ibn Battuta describes visiting the tomb of al-Bukhari, and he describes it as follows. I visited the tomb of the learned Imam Abu Abdullah al-Bukhari, compiler of al jamaa as sahih may the Sheikh of the Muslims, God be pleased with him. And over it is inscribed, this is the grave of Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, who composed such and such books. In the same manner, the tombs of the learned men of Bukhara are inscribed with their names and the titles of their writings. I had copied a great many of these. Ibn Battuta then tells us that they were in the cases that got taken away when the other ship left with his luggage. Now I noted at the beginning of this talk that Ibn Battuta was a trained legal scholar. So for him al-Bukhari would have been a great inspiration. And in fact one of the reasons that Ibn Battuta was able to travel so successfully and so relatively easily through Asia was the fact that as a legal scholar he was a highly respected individual, and he was definitely in demand. There were a couple of times where he managed to make his way by basically um, taking a position as a judge for a particular ruler for a while, earning enough money and then moving on. Now, being a legal scholar and somebody in demand was not always a good thing for Ibn Battuta. At one point, he found his way to the Maldives. And there the ruler employed him as a judge for nine months. Now, Ibn Battuta had not intended to stay at the Maldi in the Maldives for nine months, but the ruler wouldn't let him go. And eventually, basically the only way he was able to get away was to quietly plot his escape, arrange a passage on a ship while the ruler's back was turned, and then sneak off. Now, despite the fact that he had to basically make a sneaky exit, Ibn Battuta does seem on the whole to have enjoyed his time at the Maldives, in the Maldives, at least earlier. He did have some frustrations though. He complains in his work that he was unable to get the women of the Maldives to wear enough clothes to satisfy his sense of modesty. And eventually he got so annoyed with the ruler of the islands interfering in the legal cases that he was trying to judge, that this basically solidified his intention to leave. And so he did. But despite that, it's still very striking that the unified legal system was binding the Muslim world together, and that Ibn Battuta was able to take advantage of that to help ease his travels around the world. This was a guy, after all, who had been trained in Morocco, but was able to practice uh, the same legal tradition in India and in the Maldives as just two examples. So it gave him a great uh, flexibility, if you like, or a great ability to travel. Another way in which Islam contributed to the society of Asia was its role in supporting religious speculation. I commented earlier that much of the spread of Islam was achieved through the activities of missionaries. Now, many of these missionaries were Sufis, i.e. Muslim mystics, who tried to gain a closer experience of God through rituals uh, intended to achieve a higher state of consciousness and meditation. Um, this manifested in a number of different ways, including chanting rituals, dance, listening to music, Probably the best known Sufi, both in the Muslim world and the West, um, was Jalal al-Din Rumi, or Arumi, who was the inspiration for the foundation of an order of Sufis called the Mevlavis, who are also often known as the Whirling Dervishes. Ibn Battuta visited Rumi's tomb at Konya in modern Turkey, and he has this to say. 
In Konya is the mausoleum of the Sufi master and pious religious leader, the divinely inspired leader Jalal ad-Din, known as Maulana. After a dramatic religious awakening, he became demented and would only speak in Persian rhymed couplets with that no one could understand. His disciples used to follow him and write down that poetry as it issued from him, and they collected it into a book called the Masnoi. The inhabitants of that country greatly revere that book, meditate on its contents, teach it, and recite it in the hospices on Thursday nights. Now, one thing that Ibn Battuta is doing here is highlighting the reverence that Rumi and his work were given by the people of his homeland. Sufis became very popular throughout the Muslim world because they promoted a personal, emotional kind of spirituality that spoke more to the needs of the common folk than the, for want of a better word, cold intellectualism of the religious scholars and their discussions of theology and, um, and law. So it became very common for regular folks to take part in Sufi rituals on a kind of part-time basis. You know, you go down to the Sufi lodge once a week to hang out with the Sufis and take part in a chanting ritual and try and gain a more emotional experience of God. It also proved, to, Sufism also proved to be an effective outlet for the spirituality of women. Because at the time, women were being discouraged from taking part in the public worship services in the mosques in uh, the communities. So they were expected to fulfill their prayers at home. But Sufism gave them an opportunity to take part in something more, and again, something that involved trying to achieve a closer personal experience of God with a group of other people. And we see the foundation of both all female Sufi orders and also actually mixed orders of men and women worshiping together. So Sufism became a very important force or a very important outlet, let's say, for the spirituality of regular folks in their communities. And actually then the scholars got involved in Sufism and started being Sufis as well as being um, intellectuals, if you like, if we can really differentiate between the two. That's another question for another day. Meanwhile, both Sufis and other religious scholars were a force for religious dynamism in the lands where Islam spread. And some rulers started hosting religious seminars at their courts, which enabled scholars of various religions to meet and exchange ideas and debate their points. And I'm going to look slightly beyond the Middle Ages for a, an excellent example, which is the Indian Mughal ruler Akbar the Great, who ruled in between 1556 and 1605. He used to hold regular religious debates between scholars of various different faiths, and he also actually included atheists in his discussions as well. Here you can see one example of that, where you have Akbar, who is the chap with the red turban and the impressive yellow uh, robe, uh, who is sitting on his throne, listening to a number of scholars talking to him. Most of those are probably Muslim scholars, but over on the left-hand side, you can just see a couple of Jesuits. And we do actually know who these two were. This is actually based on real events. Unfortunately for Akbar, these debates turned out to be a bit of a disappointment because Increasingly, they devolved into sessions where basically scholars threw insults at each other and claimed that each other was damned. And he got a bit sick of this, and he decided to solve the problem by setting up his own religion. Now, the religion is known as Dini Alehi, which means the religion of God. And he declared that all religions were right in their own different ways. And if there were any disputes between uh, people about which religion they should be following, or what a religion was teaching, then they should turn to him, the perfect man, to resolve those disputes for them. Perhaps not surprisingly, this religion didn't last beyond Akbar's death. But nonetheless, it's an interesting example of a ruler who is trying to promote the vibrancy of religions under his, um, under his rule, uh, a tolerant form of religion, uh, and discussion between scholars over points of religion. An early case of interreligious dialogue, what can I say? 
Now, so far I've talked very much about the impact of Muslim activities on their homeland, in the lands that Muslims were ruling over. But what about elsewhere? Muslims, of course, didn't just, didn't just travel within the Muslim world. They also traveled elsewhere. In fact, merchants got all over the world. So now I'm going to turn to Ibn Battuta's visit to China and see what he has to tell us there. Just before we move on, I'll just highlight uh, this is a map depicting the network of trade routes across um, from basically Europe to uh, East Asia. Uh, this is the route that is often the set of routes that's often commonly referred to as the Silk Road. So Ibn Battuta in China. Here's what he has to say. When a Muslim merchant arrives in a Chinese town, he chooses whether to stay with one of the Muslim merchants designated among those domiciled there or in the trade hostel. If he prefers to stay with the merchant, his money is impounded. The merchant with whom he is to reside takes charge of it and spends from it on his behalf honestly. When he wishes to leave, his money is examined and if any of it is missing, the merchant with whom he has stayed and to whom it was entrusted makes it good. If he wishes to stay in the trade hostel, his money is entrusted to the master of the trade hostel, who is put in charge of it. He buys the merchant what he wants on his account. China is the safest and best country for the traveler. A man may travel for nine months alone with great wealth and have nothing to fear. What is responsible for this is that every post station in their country has a, tra uh, has a trade hostel in it which has a director living there with a company of horse and foot soldiers. In the hostels is everything the traveler needs by way of provisions. There have been Muslims living in China since the seventh century, as far as we can tell. And they soon became important figures in the commerce along that network of trade routes, the Silk Road. Large numbers of Muslims were imported by the Mongol rulers of the Yuan dynasty in the 13th and 14th centuries, and they became important administrators in the state. And actually they were going to continue to have importance in that role, even after Ibn Battuta had visited and then the Ming dynasty had taken over in 1368. Meanwhile, over the preceding centuries, Islam had spread throughout the Chinese empire through both intermarriage between Muslims and non-Muslims, and also conversion of the local people. Diversified into a number of different types. I think in the modern day, if I remember correctly, there are six legally recognized forms of Islam in China. So by the time that, and I'd emphasize, of course, that the Muslims remained a minority nonetheless, but by the time that Ibn Battuta got to China, the Muslims were well embedded in the country and in the society. And his description of China and his experience in China attest to the fact that he was coming to a society that was very used to having Muslims there and had developed a, developed a, a sophisticated system for handling their visits. Another example we see of this embedding of Muslims in Chinese society is what you see on your screen now. Uh, the Great Mosque of Xi'an was, was probably built in the 7th century and then rebuilt by a Muslim naval admiral in the service to the Ming emperors in 1392. Now, a really interesting thing about this building is that its architecture is based very much on Buddhist temple precedents and then adapted in order to allow for the necessary Muslim press spaces. This reminds us, of course, that wherever they went, the Muslims developed an architecture and actually a wider artistic tradition that synthesized local precedents and local elements and then combined those with Islamic style, if you like, often with the encouragement or at least the permission of the local rulers. So this is something that we're seeing happening both within and outside Muslim lands. Anyone who's been to India, for example, will know that a number of the mosques that you see in India very much adopt elements from pre-Muslim Hindu styles, uh, particularly in things like the fact that the way they combine red and white in the colors and things like that. And you see that basically everywhere you, you go in the Muslim world or where Muslims have been building, let's put it that way. 
Now, since we are with a mosquito in China, I'm going to highlight a couple of other things that he doesn't remark on, but which would have been relevant here and which are worth noting. One of the things that really solidified the trade net, the, well, the networks in general throughout the Muslim world was the fact that Arabic was the language of administration throughout the Muslim world. The reason it was the language of administration throughout the Muslim world was because in the 7th and 8th centuries, a caliph called Abd al-Malik, the ruler theoretically of the whole of the Muslim world at the time, had actually decided that Arabic was going to be the standard language for administering the whole of the Muslim world and had forced the ruling classes to learn it. That situation then persisted in the centuries that followed, though Persian enjoyed increasing prominence in the um, eastern part of the Muslim world as well. By the time then that Ibn Battuta was traveling, he was able to communicate with most people he met in Arabic. He occasionally refers to translators and it does seem like he didn't know Persian, but he basically had a language that allowed him to communicate with almost everybody he met, either directly or indirectly. The other thing that we can thank Abd al-Malik for, which again would have been helpful to Ibn Battuta, was the fact that throughout the Muslim world, they were also using a standard coinage. In particular, gold dinars and silver dirhams. What you're seeing on the screen at the moment uh, is an Umayyad coin from you know, roughly shortly after the reign of Abd al-Malik. Uh, Abd al-Malik had standardized the coinage such that instead of having pictures on it, it instead bore Arabic inscriptions, um, pious inscriptions, and often inscriptions naming the ruler. So for example, the inscription on the center of the coin that you're seeing on your left says, la ilaha illallah wahtahu la sharik lahu. There is no God except God alone who has no partner. A very firm assertion of Muslim monotheism. So throughout the Muslim world, merchants were using dinars and dirhams, which meant that Ibn Battuta could be carrying coins that he'd picked up in Morocco and be able to spend them in, you know, Samarkand. Um, it's rather like what one enjoys today if one travels within mainland Europe um, and in most countries can use the euro, a single currency that binds the whole region, not including Britain, together. In the case of Muslim coins in the Middle Ages, they acquired such a reputation for their quality and the purity of the precious metals that they contained, that they even came to be prized by people outside the Muslim world. What you're seeing here is a coin hoard found in a Viking grave in Scandinavia. And you can probably see that there is Arabic on the silver coins there. This is one of a number of hoards that we have from Scandinavia with Muslim coins on, because the Vikings knew those coins had a high silver content. And so thus the, the, and that purity made them very attractive. So uniformity of language and uniformity of coinage were major factors that contributed to these forces that bound the Muslim world together. Now, if we come back to Ibn Battuta's experience in China, he probably wasn't using um, Muslim coins, he would, would have had to use Chinese currency there. But at the same time, his knowledge of Arabic enabled him to deal with the local people, albeit probably through translators. Ibn Battuta doesn't really say much about language or about currency in his work. And I would say that's, I would suggest that that's not because they weren't important, but rather because he just took them for granted. He didn't really think about them. After all, how often on a day-to-day -day basis do we necessarily think about the fact that we're using a shared currency, which makes trade an awful lot easier, and we're using a shared language, which uh, makes it easier to talk to each other? These were things that just he took for granted in many ways we take for granted as well. Now, Ibn Matuta, remember, is in China, and this gives me an opportunity to tell you a hadith, a story of something that the Prophet said, which was, seek knowledge even in China. Now, admittedly, scholars dispute the authenticity of this hadith, but many adjust to the value that was given to knowledge in Islam. 
and continues to be given. It is said the ink of the scholar is worth more than the blood of the martyr, for example. But this does allow me to segue into the next Muslim contribution to Asia. But I'm going to allow Ibn Battuta, of course, to have his say first. And we are going with him west again, and we are going to land in Cairo in Egypt, where he tells us the following. As for the Maristan, the hospital near the mausoleum of al-Malik al-Mansur Kalawun, no description is adequate to its beauties. It is equipped with innumerable conveniences and medicaments, and its revenue from the Sultan is reported to be a thousand dinars a day. Now, the hospital that Ibn Battuta was referring to doesn't exist anymore. But interestingly enough, there is actually an eye hospital that is still functioning on the site. The original hospital, though, was built by the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt, Al-Mansur uh, Al Kalawun, as part of a wider complex of buildings that also included the Sultan's tomb and a madrasa, a religious college, which allows me to highlight Muslim contributions to knowledge throughout and beyond Asia. The Muslims placed great importance on the acquisition of knowledge from the earliest days. And when they took over Byzantine and Persian territory in the seventh and eighth centuries, one of the things that they started doing fairly swiftly was taking the works of um, knowledge that they found there, uh, particularly from you know, the classical Greco-Roman tradition, but also from the Persian tradition. Later on, they're bringing in works in Sanskrit as well. And they translated them into Arabic and then disseminated them throughout the Muslim world so that people could use them. The Caliph al-Ma'amun is credited with having taken a particular interest in science and was so excited about it that he actually founded a research library known as the Beit al-Hikmah in Baghdad, the uh, House of Wisdom. And there he recruited an army of translators, mostly Christians who knew both the uh, classical languages and Arabic, and had them basically working, uh, translating works of science and other subjects into Arabic so that scholars could then work on them. Those works then spread across the Muslim world. They were worked on by Muslim scholars and then eventually found their way into Europe. This, for example, is a book on algebra, which was produced by a scholar uh, called, from Persia called Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. The book is called Kitab al muhtasar fi Hasab al Jabal wal muqabala the compendious book on calculation by completion and balancing. And this work, I mean, al Khwarizmi lived in the ninth century. This was then translated into Latin in the 12th century. And it was thus that algebra was introduced to Europe. And works like this one contributed to the 12th century period of intellectual ferment, if you like, in Europe, uh, known as the 12th century Renaissance. Al Khwarizmi has been doubly immortalized, actually, as it happens, because not only is the word Al Jabr drawn from his, the title of his book used, or has that given us the word algebra, but also Al Khwarizmi himself, uh, the, was, his name was rendered into Latin as algorithmi, which then became the word algorithm, which we use in mathematics. Interestingly enough, um, this was the other thing that the Muslims did was to pick up what we call the Arabic numbers and the concept of zero from India, which made mathematics a whole lot easier because anyone who's ever tried to do arithmetic using Roman numerals knows that it's not a good time. But we call them Arabic numbers, interestingly enough, because we got them from the Arabic intellectual tradition. In Arabic, those are called Hindi numbers because they came from India and Hindi is the Arabic for Indian. So there you go. Now, of course, the advances that were made in Muslim intellectual activity weren't just in mathematics. And we have records of Muslim scholars and scientists getting involved in most fields of study. Now, thinking back to Ibn Battuta's uh, experience of the hospital, there were a number of Muslims who made significant advances in medicine. Uh, one example being Abu Bakr al-Razi, uh, referred to as Razes in the Latin texts, who became very famous for his work on medicine. He drew on the Greek and Syriac 
and Indian traditions. But then, and perhaps more importantly, he supplemented that with the observations that he made. He scrupulously wrote down uh, details about the stages of progress of various diseases that he was treating people for. His work then became a handbook that was used by other Muslim doctors to treat the sick. So he's one of the ones who kind of forges the way in the idea of observation and using the evidence of observation to help you uh, with making further advances. There are, of course, plenty of other Muslim scholars I could cite. There's Al Hussein ibn Sina, a philosopher, a, a um, philosopher and physician. Uh, he's known to us in the West as Avicenna. Uh, there is the another philosopher and also a religious thinker and jurist, Muhammad ibn Rushd, known in the West as Averroes. But I think we've made our point. The activities of Muslim scholars provided a great contribution to the intellectual milieu of Asia and beyond as they took works of earlier wisdom and worked on them, synthesized them, translated them, uh, developed their own ideas that they contributed to the tradition as well. In the process, they also established networks of scholars who exchanged ideas over far distances because most of these people are writing in Arabic or Persian, which means that you know, a scholar in Cordoba can write a work in Arabic and send it to his friend who's living in you know, Merv, and they'll be able to exchange ideas that way. It's rather like the way that Latin worked in Europe, uh, particularly in the uh, sort of 11th, 12th centuries and following with the birth of the um, university tradition. Now, from Cairo, we're going east again. Uh, we're going to wind up in Shiraz, in Persia, because here Ibn Battuta visited the grave of Sa'adi of Shiraz, probably one of the greatest poets the world has ever seen. And he describes the tomb of Sa'adi as follows. Among the sanctuaries outside Shiraz is the grave of the pious sheikh, known as a Sa'adi, who was the greatest poet of his time in the Persian language, and sometimes introduced Arabic verses into his compositions. It has attached to it a hospice, which he had built in that place, a fine building with a beautiful garden inside it, close by the source of the great river known as Urukan Abad. The sheikh constructs small cisterns in marble to wash clothes in. People go out from the city to visit his tomb, and they eat from his table, wash their clothes in the river, that river, and return home. I did the same thing at his tomb, May God have mercy upon him. Now, Saadi is best known for two works. The first is Bustan, which means orchard or the orchard. This is a verse work that seeks to teach Muslim virtues and reflects on the activities of Sufis, those mystics whom I mentioned earlier. Then there is Gulistan, the rose garden, which is mainly in prose, but also includes some poems as well. And it tells stories some of which are based very much on the author's own experiences. He also gives advice and humorous anecdotes as part of the content. Now, Saadi is interesting. He, he has a strong sense of the absurd nature of human existence. And within his work, he does kind of touch on that or does certainly reflect on that idea. In a, in, he's, he's kind of an earlier version of Camus for those who are interested with his, uh, who are familiar with his philosophy. Again, this sense of the absurdity of human existence. Now, some of you may be wondering what they were doing washing their clothes in the river at Saadi's tomb and eating off his table and all that kind of stuff. Although, strictly speaking, in the, uh, in the view of Islamic law, pilgrimage to the tombs of holy figures isn't really permitted because you're in danger of worshipping them instead of worshipping God. This was something that people did and continue to do anyway. And so by taking part in these activities, these people are trying to gain what's known as baraka, uh, blessing, a just a, a sense of, of divine favour, if you like, in a kind of nebulous sense uh, as a result of uh, their visit to the tomb of the perceived saint. Now, Saadi was, of course, not the only uh, literary figure active during the time that, uh, or during, in the time leading up to the time that Ibn Battuta uh, visited his tomb. 
But funnily enough, the probably best known work of Muslim literature has no known author. I am referring, of course, to the Arabian Nights or the Thousand and One Nights, which is a folktale collection that compiles stories from all over Asia and beyond. And it's influenced by traditions from India and Persia and Arabia, ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, the Jewish diaspora, uh, Turkish Asia Minor, and many more. One of the things that keeps scholars of the Arabian Nights in a job at the moment is trying to figure out all the various influences that affect what's found in its pages. So, to conclude, today we've traveled with Ibn Battuta to a range of places in Asia, including both within and outside the Muslim world. And in the process, I've tried to highlight a few of the contributions that Muslims made to the uh, various areas of life in Asia. Now, it's worth noting that an awful lot of what I've mentioned, things like religious tolerance and uniform legal systems and trade and popular religious activity and intellectual activity, these aren't things that the Muslims invented. But the activities of Muslims did much to energize these activities and give them a new dynamism, both within and beyond the lands over which Muslims ruled. And in addition, despite the political fragmentation, as we've seen, there were a number of networks that were established by Muslims that helped to keep the Muslim world together in various ways, enabling trade and intellectual exchange and cultural interactions, and for one Muslim at least, enabling him to travel 73,000 miles on a journey to see the world. And so our own journey with Ibn Battuta has come to an end now. And all that remains for me then is in anticipation to wish you all an Eid al-Adha Mubarak and to thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Neil Christie, uh, for this very insightful uh, and interesting uh, talk. Um, and um, thank you for your Eid, Eid greetings as well. Uh, Eid al-Adha is the second uh, uh, most important event in Muslim uh, calendar. Uh, and this, is, this event is going to be celebrated on this Friday um, in Canada and across the world. So I also congratulate all uh, those who are observing, uh, or following, or celebrating Eid al-Adha on this Friday. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the uh, end of our um, lecture. Now it's time for your questions. Uh, I'll ask the participants to, to feel free uh, to raise any questions for Dr. Christie uh, regarding the um, topic that he has covered. You can type your questions in the, in the chat box. So as uh, other people might ask, uh, I was thinking about your questions. I have a question for, for you, Dr. Christie. That, um, so Ibn Battuta was a traveler uh, from, the, from the Middle Ages, and um, he traveled far and wide and uh, wrote his travelogue, uh, which mm -hmm. you shared with us. And uh, so how, uh, and then you also mentioned, oh, okay, okay. So I, I was going to ask you that, is it, is it available in a book form or okay, it is? Yep. This is a selection. I think it's covers about roughly a third of the um, of the work, um, and it's it's an older translation, but it's uh, still a good one. Um, and yeah, it's published by Picador, and it's relatively easy to get hold of, um, probably via Amazon as much as anything in these days. Yeah. There you go. Okay, um, I got a I got a hand up from Hani Awan. Uh, I let her uh, ask her question directly. Okay. Or Hania one. You'll need to unmute yourself, Hania. Oh, okay. So, Hello. Hello. I can Hi. hear you. So you had a question? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I saw your hand up and that's very important. Thank you. All right. Thank you anyway. 
Okay, and um, I'm finding in the Q and A there is a uh, all right. Yes, there's a comment, not a question. Right, yeah. Okay, a question there from uh, Patricia. Uh, just a question of curiosity: How old was Ibn Battuta when he started his journey? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, the short answer is we don't know. Um, but one thing that is worth noting um, is that in Islam, you are an adult when you hit puberty. So it's entirely possible that he was quite young when he started, um, given that I suppose he dies at the age of, let me just do some simple math here. Uh, he dies at the age of roughly somewhere between 64 and... Um, wow. Yep. Uh, actually, I can tell you how old he was, come to think of it, uh, because we know when he left and we know when he was born. And so uh, we can actually add that up. Uh, he was uh, 21. There you go. Wow. So he, actually, he, was, he was beginning to become quite the mature adult at that age in those days. OK, um, anybody else? I think I'm sorry. I think I'm I, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Oh, it's Patricia. I just wanted to say that that was really interesting, and and I've been fortunate enough to travel through some of those areas. So it's really interesting to hear what you were talking about and kind of envisioning what I saw there and thinking it in, in the context. Well, I'm glad that. Um... I'm glad that uh, you enjoyed it. Yes. Uh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a, an amazing area to go through and just so full of history. So I really appreciated your talk. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Yeah, I would like to add uh, to Patricia Rua. She's uh, she's a band director as well, and I can tell you that she's uh, um, she's an avid travel, and she probably has been to many parts of the world and still aspiring to go to the whatever is less, less uh, is left. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Okay, anybody else? And uh, another qu question uh, regarding um, Ibn Battuta. So he, whatever he wrote, uh, and then you mentioned that he also lost his luggage, and it is quite possible that he might have lost some of his uh, travel ops or some of his writings in, in, mm -hmm. in that lost luggage. Um, and so whatever whatever he wrote, um, and was that probably that was in Arabic, right? So and eventually that was translated into English and other languages. That's correct. Yes, he would have been writing in Arabic. His uh, travelogue is in Arabic, uh, the original, and then um, and the other works he refers to when he talks about uh, uh, Al Bukhari's tomb there uh, would be his copies of the Arabic texts from figures like al-Bukhari. I mean, in the, in the period, of course, books, I mean, they get published basically by being passed around and copied. So he would have had his copy of um, al-Bukhari by basically getting hold of someone else's copy, uh, transcribing it. And then, you know, it was in his luggage and was what, among one of probably the many lamented works that he never saw again after that. And then he had to go off and uh, copy them all down. So I suppose it was one thing that would give him time to, uh, or give him something to keep him occupied when he was, for example, marooned in the Maldives. <laughs> okay, yeah. And uh, uh, another question, it's more like an academic question, that um, so all his travel logs, which he wrote and eventually were, I'm sure, uh, have been researched over the years, uh, over the decades. So um, how consistent historians have found his travel logs uh, with, uh, with the, with a, with a well-established history that we know through the mainstream historians? Um, as far as I know, there aren't any, well, I mean, they're gonna be aberrations, but there aren't any major aberrations where uh, people have necessarily said, oh, well, you know, this is clearly rubbish because he doesn't know what he's talking about because this is how it was at the time. But at the same time, the kind of information that we get from Ibn Battuta is very different from the sort of information that you get in regular historical chronicles because your average medieval chronicler is interested in battles, politics, rulers, and religion, basically. Um, 
Ibn Battuta, though, is the guy who's describing hippopotami and uh, cannibals in Africa. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's, he's uh, talking about gigantic chickens in China. Seriously, they're there. Uh, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so he, it's, a, it's much more of a kind of person on the ground kind of vision of the Muslim world, even though he is himself a religious scholar as well. And that's important to him. Um, but this is why these travelogues are so valuable, is because they give us a different perspective on the events and the world of the time. Uh, the other really well-known uh, travelogue is by a chap called Muhammad ibn Jubair. Again, you can find it in a Penguin edition. Um, and uh, he traveled in the 12th century, did the Hajj and went back. He was from Spain. He actually, um, he decided he was going to perform the Hajj because he was guilty. He was, guilt he was feeling guilty because he had been forced by his patron in Cordoba, I think it was, uh, to drink seven cups of wine. And he felt so guilty about that, that he decided the only way he was going to expiate his sin was to perform the Hajj. So he traveled all the way to uh, Mecca and back and in the process gave us his impressions of things like the Crusader states and what the Crusaders are up to. One thing that's very interesting about the travelers as well in comparison to the regular chronicles is because they are in many ways foreigners to the lands that they visit. They're a lot more judgmental of the people that they visit, including the other Muslims. You know, both Ibn Battuta and Ibn Jawar complain that there are Muslims who aren't being Muslim, Muslim enough in their view because they don't know the local dynamics and thus they don't really um, have a sense of exactly what's appropriate in a given environment, which means they sometimes commit some interesting faux pas um, in all sorts of ways. Ibn Bat thinking back to Africa again, Ibn Battuta um, at one point heard he was going to receive a gift from the ruler of Mali. And he thought, great, gold, jewels, robes of honor, this will be awesome. And then the gift arrived and it was a dish of food. And he says, and I burst out laughing that anyone could think that this was a valuable gift. But of course, to the people of Mali, it probably was a valuable gift and a sign of hospitality. And some, sometimes Ibn Battuta can be a bit of an obnoxious tourist, to be honest. <laughs> but there you go. Okay. Um, we got another question um, via chat. Um, that, did Ibn Battuta have a job before he went exploring? Uh, how did that impact his travels? Did he have a job, did we say? Yeah, did he have a job before he went uh, exploring? I, I hope that question is not connected with his financial situation, but more like his, his persona or his experiences. Well, it is likely that before he started traveling, he was working as a, as a religious and legal scholar in Morocco, where he was growing up. And then, you know, he decided to go on the Hajj, uh, and took off at, I think we eventually established the age of 21. Um, and then as we saw, he was able to continue using that knowledge base and that expertise to get work to continue to support his travels in the sort of early version of backpacking or something, I suppose. Um, and um, then when he went home, he became a legal scholar in the provinces again. So I don't get the impression that he was doing anything different um, before he set off. Um, another question. Sorry, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, hello, I just my microphone is already open. I was waiting for the line. Okay, please uh, Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you yes, hear us? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I do, I do, I do. First, I would like to thank about the amazing presentation. Uh, since I'm also a Muslim girl, but I don't have that much of a perception of the history and I wasn't like familiar with the people okay. that the traveler that you mentioned uh i have two questions uh, actually that i think about it uh, since he stayed a lot in the different countries rather than his hometown uh, is he contributed a new vocabularies in uh, arabic language that he learned in maybe in china or in india that he added to uh, arabic vocabulary because languages are affected by each other so yeah. th that's the that one asked the question yeah okay uh, i'm not aware that ibn battuta himself was necessarily responsible for certain words passing into arabic from the other places that he went but you've certainly highlighted a really important point which is that you know all these travelers merchants these people are taking 
language with them wherever they go. And so words will be passing back and forth, often without anyone really, be, really being conscious that they, they're doing it. Um, this is something, of course, that crosses faith boundaries as well. I mean, there are an amazing number of words in English, for example, that begin with the word mm -hmm. al, and that's because mm -hmm. al is the definite article in Arabic, as you know, and mm -hmm. then it becomes a word in English, alchemy, um, algorithm, um, yeah. even alcohol is an Arabic yeah. word, which is actually... Yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. Uh, and also the other uh, question that I, I want to ask uh, is, I, I'm wondering if you ever like mentioned uh, the similar points be, uh, that the other religions he come across uh, with the Islam, because uh, when we look at the languages, most of them are have some common and similarities. But in Asia, uh, especially like India and China, there are a great uh, amount of religion or maybe beliefs that people are believing, and mm -hmm. some sort of they have some uh, similar practices that they are doing for example buddhists are waking up in the early for praying same goes with the muslims is he mention any of them in his uh, studies or in his journal that uh, yeah this is some sort of similar or oh maybe this could be that that, that can be like be beneficial if he added to the uh, worshiping like the the schedule i see what you're, I see what you're saying <clears throat> Um, he yeah. doesn't ex go on. Sorry, I interrupt. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, I mean, he doesn't explicitly say, "Oh, you know, here's something the Christians are doing that's kind of like what we do." Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he is a Maliki scholar, traditionally a school that at the time was very conservative, and you know, we saw things like, for example, his objection to the fact that the women in the Maldives didn't wear enough clothes for his sense of modesty. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, he does comment on other religious traditions that he encounters. Yeah. One kind of really interesting point he raises at one point is he yeah. meets a holy man in India. Mm -hmm. And he's pretty convinced that this guy is a crypto Muslim. This guy, you know, oh. he's pretending to be a Hindu holy man, but he reckons mm -hmm. he's actually a Muslim from yeah. things that he says. So mm -hmm. he's got an awareness of that kind of thing, but mm -hmm. uh, he's not sort of producing some sort of theological treatise or where oh, he's explicitly yeah. addressing these kinds of similarities. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. You. Yeah, and at the same time, thank you so much for celebrating our festival as well today. I mean, in here, I'm, I'm living in Turkey, so it's already Friday. Uh, right. so. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you for tuning yeah. in. Oh, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, we have uh, one, one more question from Leticia Sanchez who's the president of uh, VAMS. Leticia? Hi, thank you for being with us. I, I, I'm trying to type here, but it's, it's hard. But um, yeah, I, I was uh, listening about uh, that relationship that even Batuta had with, um, with China and the emperors. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if you can uh, tell me how, how close was that relationship? Right? Because I think it was the emperor Temur at the time that even Batuta was traveling to China. And, uh, and, and many people talk about the, the travels of um, this other travel uh, um, from Italy. Okay. And, uh, and, Marco Polo? And, uh, sorry? Marco Polo? Yeah, Marco Polo. Mm -hmm. Marco Polo, but uh, I, I, I think that it could have been a very interesting relationship among uh, this Chinese emperor and, and Ibn Battuta. Okay, as far as we know, Ibn Battuta, I mean, Timur is ruling in Transoxania and basically whatever he was able to conquer in the surrounding regions. And as far as I know, Ibn Battuta did meet Timur, though I'm not oh. familiar with the encounter or with the uh, uh, with his. Did he meet Timur? No, actually, I think he's a little early. I, I'm not too sure. I, I think that yeah. at that time, the Yuan dynasty, that was, I was wondering if that was the time. But it, it would be very interesting to, to know more about that relationship between China and, and the Muslim um, mm -hmm. world, because um, it always seems like a contradictory, but at the same time, unifying uh, idea of uh, religious idea or, or Philosophic, philosophical ideas. 
Right. Uh, well, I mean, once he got outside of Muslim controlled territory, um, Ibn Battuta wasn't meeting rulers in the same way that he was within Muslim territory. And he wasn't. So, you know, he, he is treated in China basically the same way as any other merchant or visitor might be treated, uh, as, you know, he describes. Um, so he's not moving in the same kind of exalted circles. Right, right. Um, you know, the Yuan dynasty are primarily Buddhist, if I remember correctly, even though they were employing Muslims as uh, administrators in the state. Yeah. Um, so he can't really speak to it on the same level that he can within the Muslim world, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Okay, so any other questions uh, before uh, we sign out? Okay, so I have a final question. Looks like uh, we have exhausted all the questions from the participants. Um, uh, and that'll be the final question that we have. Um, that did Ibn Battuta use any or pr produce any any images or any drawings of the, well, I know there's no photographs, but something of that sort, uh, images of, of the places that he visited or any maps, for example? No, he didn't. Uh, and in fact, we don't have any images of Ibn Battuta at all. Uh, the image that I showed you um, at the beginning of the um, talk, uh, the medieval image is sometimes described as being an image of Ibn Battuta, but it's not. It's an image of a traveler from a uh, work of fiction, the Maqamat, um, from a particular manuscript. And there have been a number of other depictions of him. Um, I showed you another one towards the end of the talk. Um, and in fact, um, in Dubai, in the Ibn Battuta Mall, um, which is basically a huge complex themed along various different countries, um, named after Ibn Battuta because you know, he went to all of these places. Uh, there is a little effigy of Ibn Battuta. I believe he's sitting on an elephant, if I remember correctly, or something like that. But yeah, we don't have any idea what he looked like, and we don't have any maps or anything that he created for us, um, which would have been really interesting if he had. But he just stuck to a text description, basically. Thank you very much, Dr. Neil Christie. That brings us to the end of uh, uh, this presentation. And um, on behalf of the Board of Directors of uh, Vancouver Asian Heritage Month Society, uh, I want to thank you for, for your contribution to uh, this um, uh, the work that we do uh, to, by, by connecting society and promoting Pan-Asian uh, Pan um, cultural um, heritage uh, to the wider Canadian society. And, um, Thank you to all the participants for, for being here, uh, for being part of this, uh, uh, this event of uh, WAMS Connections, and we hope to have more in the future. Um, and thank you to all those who asked questions and uh, uh, contributed to this conversation. Uh, with that, uh, I, I stop here and uh, wish you all the best and have a nice long weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.